The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in the first chapter and reading verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. Now, we've been engaged on a number of Sunday mornings in looking at this great statement, having first of all looked at it um, as it were in general, and uh, having emphasized the fact that the ultimate object and purpose of the incarnation, the word being made flesh, was that we who believe in him should be made the children or the sons of God, we have gone on to consider how we may know exactly that this is true of us, that we are indeed the children of God. Now, this is important, uh, as we've seen from many, many angles and standpoints. If God sent his Son into the world in order that we might be made the children of God, well, then we must realize that. That to be a Christian is not merely to be a nice or a good or a moral man, not merely one who likes the teaching of Jesus as they put it and does his best to put it into practice. That isn't a Christian. A Christian is a man who is born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. The Son of God became the Son of men, as Calvin put it, in order that the sinful sons of men might be made the sons of God. We take it that this gospel was written in order to remind the first Christians who were tending to forget that great and glorious fact, that that is nevertheless their position as Christians. These early Christians were derided and were persecuted and thereby were were ever prone to become discouraged. So these Gospels and the New Testament epistles were written to them in order that they might realize what God had done for them in Christ. And here is the supreme thing, that we are made the children of God to as many as received it, gave he power, authority, the right to become the children of God. And therefore we have argued that nothing is more important in this life and in this world as that we should be absolutely certain that we are the children of God. Unfortunately, the New Testament provides us with an abundance of tests which we can apply to ourselves. The only Christian that's ultimately of any value in a world like this is the assured Christian. Assurance of salvation has always been the mark of a live church, not some vague belief or some hopefulness that ultimately we may become Christians. It is the men who have known that they have passed from death to life and that they are indeed the children of God. Therefore, we are applying these tests to ourselves and having looked at our relationship in particular to the Son, we have looked at our relationship to the Father, and at the moment we are engaged in examining our relationship to the Holy Spirit in order to make certain that we are the children of God. Because the moment you become a child of God, you are in this relationship with the triune God. Now, in looking at particular at our relationship to the Spirit, We have seen that the first epistle of John, in particular, gives us very rich teaching on that relationship, but it isn't confined to that. There is that mighty statement in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They were led by the Spirit. So, having looked at our general relationship to the Spirit, we are now examining, in this particular way, the evidence that we can have within ourselves that we are being led by the Spirit. And uh, we have seen that uh, when the Spirit does lead, uh, certain things inevitably happen. 
We have found that he leads to this word. We have found that he leads to prayer and to certain types of prayer. And then we came on and said a fortnight ago that he also leads us in the matter of conduct and of behavior. And that is the matter we are dealing with at the moment. Now, we had to give the whole of last Sunday morning to a very general point and principle with regard to this. Because the moment you begin to talk about the leading of the Spirit, in any sense, you are at once uh, exposed to the danger of separating between the Spirit and the Word. And we illustrated this last Sunday morning in the case of the Quakers, who have recently called attention to themselves in a certain pronouncement. And what we were anxious to do was to show that this recent pronouncement of the Quakers on morals is not at all a surprising thing. It is the inevitable outcome of their false division between the spirit and the word, their exaltation of the inner light over the objective word of God. There is nothing which is more dangerous than to separate the spirit from the word. The spirit guides through the word. That is his customary way of leading us. It is he who has indicted the word. It is he who moved and carried along the ancients, the prophets, and others who have given us these records. Holy men of God spake, as Peter puts it, as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Ghost. Prophecy is not of any private interpretation. And the same applies, of course, to the New Testament scriptures. The Apostle Peter again tells us that the writings of the Apostle Paul are scriptures. And of course they are. And the church led by the Spirit formed the canon of the New Testament and added it to the canon of the Old Testament because they believed that this is indeed the word of God and not the mere ideas and theories and imaginings of men. Very well. There is nothing more fatal than to put a wedge between the Spirit and the Word and to say you don't need the word, that you are now directly guided and motivated and moved by the Holy Spirit himself, by some inner light. Well, now, that is a very, very grievous danger. And we were able to look at its manifestation in this striking modern instance. But, of course, this is not confined to the Quakers. All people in the church today who don't recognize the authority of the word are in exactly the same position. And Unitarians are not confined to that particular body that calls itself the Unitarian Church. Unless there are Unitarians in every section of the church. And they fall into precisely that same error of judging everything by their own reason or their own intuition or their own insights rather than by the plain objective teaching of the Word of God. Very well. We must leave that. And having now then established that all-important principle that we are to be guided in conduct and behavior in our view of morals and of everything else by the illumination of the Spirit upon the Word and not by modern ideas or modern developments or modern theories, we now come to the more practical aspect of this great subject. Very well then, there are three general points, it seems to me, which we must further note before we come to the actual details. And here are the three. The first is that this test of uh, our being guided in the matter of conduct and of behavior by the Spirit through the Word is one of the most practical tests of all. And that is why it is one of the most important tests. There is no greater danger to the Christian than the danger of what is called antinomianism. And antinomianism means this, of course, that now we are saved and we are eternally safe and saved, therefore it doesn't matter what I do. That's antinomianism. That because I'm born again, because I'm no longer in Adam, because I'm no longer under the law, that it doesn't matter what I do, that I'm free to live as I like and as I please. Now, that's a terrible danger, danger that is dealt with 
so often in the scriptures themselves, the Apostle Paul was always being charged by his adversaries as a teacher of antinomianism. When he taught so powerfully about the Christian being dead to the law and delivered from the law and dead to sin and so on. This was the charge they always brought against him. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He has said, you see, that where grace, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Very well, they said. That means that conduct doesn't matter. The more we sin, the more we shall experience grace. Let us therefore sin that grace may abound. God forbid, says the apostle. It's unthinkable. It is indeed to misunderstand the whole of the teaching of justification by faith only and our incorporation into Christ and the Spirit coming to live and to dwell within us. We are dead to sin and we must no longer walk therein. Very well then, you see, this is a, a most important uh, test. That's why we don't like it. We like to dwell in the realm of feelings and experiences. We are like the people depicted by our Lord who say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and done this, that, and the other? But my dear friend, I don't care what experience you've had. If it hasn't affected your daily life and living, your ethics, your morals, it isn't an experience produced by the Holy Spirit. You are not born of God. Unless there is a change in your whole outlook and attitude to conduct and behavior, and learned unless it is manifesting itself practically, you are not being led by the Spirit. You are being led by some false spirit, some evil spirit masquerading as a spirit of light and as the spirit of God. No, no. These things are again indissolubly linked together. As the spirit and the word are, so the new birth and a new conduct are indissolubly linked and bound. Therefore, this test of conduct and of behavior is a very practical one. You may say, I never have these exalted feelings that people talk about. I don't know these are thrilling, exciting experiences of the Spirit. How can I tell whether I'm a Christian? You can tell in this way. Has your whole outlook upon life and living changed? If it has, you have good presumptive evidence of the fact that you are a Christian. But we'll come to that in details. I'm simply laying down now this principle. That there is no more grievous error than that of antinomianism. The Christian life is essentially a practical life. It isn't only a practical life. That's the error of today. But it is a practical life. It's a life that starts in the realm of the spirit. This new birth. But it manifests itself in all the practical details of life. Well, let's go on to our second principle, which is this one. That uh, this uh, practical outworking of the uh, life of the Spirit, or life in the Spirit, is something which is constant, and meant to be constant in the life and experience of the Christian. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, he says, as many as are constantly being led, as many as go on being led, it's the continuous. And I do want to emphasize this continuous aspect. The Christian is not to be good by fits and starts. He is not to be good only at certain times of the year. There is not a scrap of evidence in the whole of Scripture for the observance of Lent. None at all. Indeed, I could very easily show you and demonstrate to you that it is diametrically opposed to the teaching of the Scripture and is nothing but a human carnal tradition introduced by men. Now, there's no need to go any further than that chapter which we read at the beginning, which puts it all so perfectly. There it was at the end of Colossians 2. Let no man beguile you of your reward, 
in some sort of voluntary humility and worshipping of angels and so on, but still more specifically. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as the living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, exercising your will power and your discipline and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Well, there it is, you see, there's the whole thing dealt with. It looks very wonderful. Show of wisdom. Will worship. During this period of Lent, I don't smoke or I don't drink or I don't do this, that or the other. And here it is, it's marvelous. During this period, I'm denying myself. The answer of the New Testament to that is this. That you're to do what the Spirit leads you to do always. Always. Not only at certain times of the year, not only certain periods in the calendar of some human-made organization. No, no, this is to be constant. You're always led by the Spirit. If it's right to deny yourself during Lent, it's right to deny yourself always. And that is the teaching of the New Testament. And here again, you see, is something which is very subtle. That, of course, is a relic of Roman Catholicism. Lent comes from them. It's been taken over. It was started by them. It's been continued by them. One can easily understand it in such an organization. It gives power to the priest and so on. But there is, as I say, no evidence whatsoever in favor of it in the New Testament. And it just leads to this show of wisdom and man's willpower. It's man adding his works to the grace of God, which is essentially Roman Catholic teaching. Grace of God plus what man does, what the church does, and so on. Well, my friends, let's get rid of this. Let's not waste our time with it. We are to be led by the Spirit always. And my third general principle is this one. That the leading of the Spirit in this matter of conduct and of behavior is never anything mechanical. And this is a continuation, of course, of the last point. What I mean by saying that it is not mechanical, it doesn't mean a conformity to an imposed number of rules and regulations. This, again, is quite a subtle point, and it's a trap which has often ensnared many Christian people. It's always easier to live under a rigid law than it is to live in the freedom of the Holy Spirit and, its, and his guidance. What we all crave for is this. We say, now we've become Christians. What am I to do? What am I not to do? And we rather like people who have it for us. One, two, three. Drill sergeant Christianity, you might call it. Of course, it's much easier. You don't have any thinking. You don't know any tensions. But that's not New Testament. That is typical of this false asceticism which the apostle is denouncing at the end of the second chapter of the epistle to the Colossians. No, the Spirit doesn't lead us like that. He leads us in the more general manner which you see he goes on to put before us in chapter 3. If ye then be risen in Christ, with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, there's your principle. In other words, he says, realize what you are and who you are as the children of God. Realize that you now belong to that heavenly realm, that our citizenship is in heaven, not upon earth. Very well, set your affections there. You don't just say, now, what's this? What am I supposed to do here? What am I not to do there? That's a ready reckoner view of Christianity. That's not the New Testament Christianity. Oh, no, but you say to yourself, what am I? I'm born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. I'm belonging to Christ, and I'm a co-heir with him. My home is there. So you begin to see it in that way, and then you carry out the implications. You are dead, he says, and your life is hid with Christ in God. 
It's theological. You see yourself in Christ. Not a matter, not a matter of rules and regulations and tabulations. I've done this and I haven't done that. No, no, that's all wrong. That's mechanical. That's human. That's an imposed morality. Again, of course, it's the delight of all institutional Christianity. But it knows nothing about the freedom of the spirit. It knows nothing of the position of the early Christian. Very well, I say, instead of uh, thus conforming to a pattern and having these mechanical notions of morality and ethics and conduct and behavior, he goes on to put it in more general terms. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. See, that's the difference in the outlook. Not what am I to do now that I'm a Christian, or I am a Christian and he's going to appear and I'm going to see him. And I'm going to be made like him. Very well, what do I do? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And so on. He gives the details in order that we may see how inevitably the principle will work it out in this, work itself out in this way and manner. Very well, let me summarize that third general principle by putting it like this. If our conduct is not the outcome of our doctrine, if our behavior is not dictated to us by the fact that we realize who and what we are as the children of God and in Christ, then it is not New Testament ethics and morality. It is philosophical morality. It is man's morality. This is always a deduction which one draws. How often have we seen it? Here's the analysis of every New Testament epistle. You start with your great doctrine, then he says, therefore. And if your conduct and behavior are not determined by this therefore, which deduces it all from the doctrine, it's a false asceticism. It is not the way the Holy Spirit leads the children of God in this matter of their daily conduct and behavior. Well, now then, there it seems to me are the general points which uh, govern this all-important matter. But come, let us go on to the details. And I go on to the details mainly for this reason, that what we are trying to do in this whole series of sermons is to give comfort to God's people. What is in the forefront of my mind is not merely to inculcate a certain way of living, but to give people assurance of salvation. So as we come to the details, what I'm concerned about is that we should examine ourselves in the light of them and say, well, that's true of me. And if that's true of me, I'm being led by the Spirit of God. I may not have known great experiences, alas, but I do know this. No, that's not a criticism of the great experiences. We all ought to have them, and we all ought to seek them. It is possible to know God and to know Christ. Don't stop short of that. But I say, you can be a Christian and know you're one short of that. So I'm putting this before you, not that I may fall into the error I've been denouncing, but rather that I may encourage you as you examine yourself to find that you've got full assurance. Well, what are these details? How may I know that the Holy Spirit is indeed leading me in this very practical way? Well, here's my first answer. It's in the Apostle second, it's in the second chapter of his epistle to the Philippians. In uh, the statement in verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, what he tells us is this. You, says the apostle, must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
And he says, you do so because it is God who is working in you to work it out with fear and trembling. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do. Well, very well, this becomes a very valuable test, doesn't it, in this way? The Christian is conscious of this fact that God is working in him. Both to will and to do. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. God works in us, in and through and by the Holy Spirit. And he works in us both to will, to desire, and to do. So this to me is a very wonderful and a very consoling test. We become conscious of his working within us. And I'm going to add this. It's a very subtle and a very profound test to me. We are conscious not only that he's working in us, but we are conscious that he is working in us often against our own desire. He won't leave us alone. If I may adapt the words of George Matheson here, O oh, love that wilt not let me go. There you are as a Christian, but you've been enticed by the world and its attractions its way of living and way of thinking, and quite unconsciously. You've been backsliding, you've been going back into that old life. You didn't do anything very deliberately, but you've just been slipping and sliding, but you're back in it. And there you are, you're beginning to enjoy it again, and you think it's rather wonderful and very clever. And then you're suddenly disturbed. You're pulled up. You feel it's wrong. And you don't like this feeling. It's disturbing you. You wanted to go on enjoying it. You said, of course, I'm a Christian. I believed in Christ at that particular point, And I became a member of a church. But the Spirit says, no, you, you be careful. Uh, can you as a true Christian go on doing this? That's the Spirit of God working within us, both to will and to do. You see, he addresses us and he disturbs us. He pulls us up. He upbraids us, he condemns us, he makes us feel guilty. And he says, now this is what you ought to be doing. And he reminds you of your Christian duties which you've been neglecting. You'd stopped reading the word, you'd stopped praying, you'd stopped attending the house of God. He brings you back, he disturbs you. It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. And you're rebellious and you're fighting. But my dear friend, in all that you're having an absolute proof that you're a Christian. You are not dead in trespasses and sins, if that's true of you. The man who is not a believer, who is not born again, he doesn't know this. He may get what's called twinges of conscience, but that's an entirely different thing. That's just a man looking at his own standard. Here it is the pressure of the Spirit within, and the very definite activity of the Spirit, and you try and get away from him. You go out with your friends, or you shut your books, and you try and listen to this or that, but he won't let you. It is God that worketh in you, pulling you back disturbing you, sending some sort of Nathan the prophet to you as he sent him to David and making him put questions to you. It is God that worketh in us, both to will and to do. Do you know the working of God in you? Do you find now that you're not allowed to sin with impunity? Do you find that you're not allowed to enjoy a sinful life and an unworthy life? Are you constantly being pulled up and upbraided and condemned and convicted? That's a sign that you're being led by the Spirit. He does it in the matter of willing and of desiring. He does it in the matter of doing. He provides the desire. He gives the energy. It's all from him. He works in us. That's why we are able to work it out. We couldn't otherwise. We'd have no strength. But being born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God, we've got the spirit in us, and there's energy. And he works within us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Well, I leave it at that, but it's to me... 
Not only a very wonderful thing, but a very comforting and a very consoling thing. But come to a second, which is this. The Spirit always leads us to self-examination. Self-examination. And again, observe, I say, not only during Lent, but the whole year. Not because we've arrived at a certain date. You can't reconcile that kind of thing with the freedom and liberty of the Spirit in the New Testament. It's utterly incompatible. And that's how we fool ourselves. And we who do it on January the 1st are equally guilty, remember. This is out of the realm of calendars altogether. This is the operation of the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit. Now I say the Spirit always leads us to self-examination. What does that mean? It means this. That whosoever is led by the Spirit is never glib never feels that he or she is complete because you say, I've believed in Christ. Never feels that everything has been done and that all I do now is to rest on my oars and I need have no troubles. That is inconceivable under the leading of the Spirit. Why? Well, for this reason. that the Spirit's function is to bring us into conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His work is to carry out this injunction, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. You see, it's at this point the Spirit safeguards us from an easy believism. And the notion that as long as I say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am a Christian. But you're not. The devils believe and tremble. Many people have said that they believe, but their lives have denied it, having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. The New Testament is full of warnings against what were once called false professors, men and women who make a profession of Christianity, but who clearly are not Christians. Our Lord constantly warned people against that. The New Testament epistles are equally full of these same serious, solemn warnings. And any man who is led by the Spirit is afraid of that. He's aware of the danger. And therefore I say he's never glib, he's never self-satisfied, and above all, he's never superficial. Now, here you see is the great dividing line as between the cults and a kind of cultic Christianity and New Testament Christianity. The cults give it you all in one act. So simple, there's nothing in it. Do this, there you are. Penny in the slot. You've got your full breath. Everything you want. That is the characteristic always of the cults and of a Christianity that is cultic rather than New Testament. Because the New Testament Christianity is that which is always based upon the leading of the Spirit, and he is a person, and he is the Holy Spirit. And in his presence the best man feels that he's vile, and that he's unworthy, and that he's sinful. The other man feels as long as he's signed on the dotted line, it's all done, you're all right, you're in. No, no, says this man, this is a new birth, I've got new life, am I aware of it, am I sure of it? Prove your own selves, says the New Testament. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, writes the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. You'll find it in the last chapter of his second epistle to the Corinthians. Prove yourselves. Examine your own selves. Make certain that you're in the faith. Peter says exactly the same thing. Make your calling and election sure, he says. Don't live on assumptions. Don't be glib. Don't be superficial. Don't feel it's all finished. Oh, just realize what you are as a child of God. And the moment you do and begin to examine yourself, you'll be dissatisfied. You'll feel, I'm, this is not right, this is not enough, this is unworthy. 
The Spirit always leads us along that line. You will find, if you trouble to read the literature, that the greatest saints have always spent time in self-examination. Indeed, we can say this about them, that their greatest danger was to overdo that and to become introspective and morbid. But that's a much better danger, if I may so put it, than the danger of glibness and superficiality, the danger that doesn't even realize the possibility of being false. Make your calling and election sure. Therefore, you examine yourself. You prove your own self. It's in the word, it's in the life and the practice of the most notable instances of true Christianity exemplified in the lives of the saints. Well, I leave it at that. I say this, if you like. Let's look at it like this. If you don't know what it is to be afraid that you may be a Laodicean, I don't think you're a Christian. No man can read that letter to the church of the Laodiceans with the Spirit leading him and guiding him without having a certain amount of fear. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. In other words, you are just respectable and nothing else. You don't like being hot nor cold. You like being balanced and dignified and decent and polite. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and of need of nothing. This is all spiritual. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. The man who doesn't realize that that's his condition is in a bad case. But you say, we are not all in that condition. All I'm saying is this. Uh, are you never afraid that you are in that condition? Or are you one of these people who says, I am rich and increased with goods. I've never had a doubt since I became a Christian. I've never had any trouble at all. I know. Don't you ever have any fear about yourself? This is what... Listen, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the Spirit comes to us and he says, look here, are you Laodicean? Are you quite sure you're not resting on your oars and are not self-satisfied in this bad sense? It's a very good test, my friend. The Spirit searches. He searches the deep things of God and he searches the depths of our being and personality. And the man who's led by him is the man who gives him time to do that. And he will hold these things before you. And there may be times when he'll almost make you feel that you're not a Christian at all. But you'll know that you are because when you feel the utter uncleanness and condemnation, you know that the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, still cleanseth from all sin and unrighteousness. And you don't lie down in utter condemnation and final despair and hopelessness. But he does lead to self-examination, and it is an unmistakable sign of his leading. I say, examine yourself very carefully, unless you've ever, if you've never been disturbed about yourself, and have had a fear lest you be a Laodicean. But let me go on. Over and above leading us to self-examination, he leads to this, and this is the positive side of it. Breathings after holiness. Breathings after holiness. It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't forget that fear and trembling. That's it. That's where self-examination comes in. It will lead to fear and trembling. Do the whole thing, says Paul, in fear and trembling. So you have breathings after holiness. Or let me use other terminology. A longing for heart purity. A longing to be pure in heart. Now this is inevitable. 
if we are led by the Holy Spirit. David knew something about it. Create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, he's not stopping with his particular sins any longer. The Christian doesn't. Your moral man knows that. He says, I was a fool. I shouldn't have done that. But he stops there. I'm going to be better, he says. No more. But the Christian doesn't. The man who knows the Spirit of God, he says, create within me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Give me a heart, he says, that trembles at the approach of sin. Or you may prefer it in the language of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. O wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? A man who's never known that feeling is not a Christian. It's impossible. The Holy Spirit must make us feel that at some time or another. That's all I'm saying. I don't say you should feel like that always. I don't believe that's a true interpretation of Romans 7. But what I do know is that if a man has never felt that to some degree, some time or another, he's not a Christian. If you have known that final despair about yourself and have said in me that is to say in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me? Breathings and longings after holiness. Oh, our Lord has said it all, hasn't he? Who are the people who are blessed? Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Yes, that's it. The hungering and the thirsting, not after happiness, but after righteousness. The feeling that though you're a member of a church, though you believed in Christ, though you're born again, that it isn't enough. You want to be righteous, you want to be holy. The Holy Spirit leads ever to that desire and in that direction. He never allows us to rest upon our own. And to feel that that decision was everything. Or that since I said I believe. No, no. He, when he works within us and he works in every Christian, he creates a great hunger after it. Oh, that I were more like him. Oh, that I were more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that I were righteous. Through and through. He makes you hunger. He makes you thirst after it. Oh, for a heart. To praise my God. A heart from sin set free. A heart that always feels the blood so freely shed for me. Well, I'll sum up this test again by putting it like this. If you've got a greater desire to be holy than to be happy... You, my dear friend, are being led by the Spirit of God. It's a wonderful test, that. Your desire for holiness is greater than your desire for happiness. Is it? Can you say that? Can you say, I don't care what happens to me? As long as it makes me more holy. The moment you can say that holiness is to you more important than happiness. You are a child of God and you are being led by the Spirit. Because you will know that whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth. And you will even thank God for chastisements, whatever form it may take, because you, looking back upon it, will say with the psalmist in Psalm 119, it was good for me that I was afflicted, because before I was afflicted I went astray. It was good for me that I suffered illness, accident, loss. It's made a better man of me, and I'd sooner be holy than be happy. Even though it be a cross, 
that leadeth me. Nearer my God to thee. That's the test. It's an infallible test. Nearer my God to thee. Nearer to thee, even though it be a cross that leadeth or guideth me. Still in my dreams I'd be nearer to thee, whatever it is. Very well, my friends, let us apply these things. And the last word I say on it this morning is this. And it follows, of course, each one of these leads to the next. An increasing sensitiveness, or sensitivity if you prefer it, to temptation and to the very approach of sin. There it is. The cry for that heart that trembles at the very approach of sin. You're not only grieved by sin when you've committed it, but you're grieved because the very approach of it. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Doesn't it worry you that you don't hate evil as you should? Doesn't it worry you that you still like things that you shouldn't? And that you can still be appealed to and attracted by things that are unclean in this modern world of ours? Doesn't that worry you? If it does, it's the spirit. If it doesn't, you haven't got the spirit. Trembles at the approach of sin. And doesn't wait to be grieved until it's embraced it and has been defeated by it. Any man who can say that he's increasingly sensitive to the enticements, the attractions, the approach, the first moves of sin, is a man who's filled with the Spirit, is being led by the Spirit, the Spirit's sensitive. And he, above all, detects it at its merest suggestion, at its first glimmering. Well, we leave it at that for this morning. God willing, we'll have to go on with this. But as I'm trying to show and to say, what we should be concerned about is this, is not so much the details as our whole approach and attitude. Are we finding in all this evidences and proofs of the fact that we are indeed the children of God Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.